this morning, Lord, and how it was lived and how it was given up so that we might have in life in eternity with you. Lord, speak through our pastor this morning. Convict our hearts of our sin and reveal to us the mercy and grace that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Up on the screen, uh, you may have uh, just seen the background here and and even question why a grain field, why that background of a grain field. Uh, Miss Kim, when she was asking me what kind of background I wanted for this sermon series, I told her a grain field. And I want you to think about uh, the imagery of that grain that really goes all the way through this story uh, in Joseph's life. Uh, we begin with, in Genesis 37, with Joseph having uh, this dream or these dreams. And one of those dreams that Joseph had was that there were these bundles of grain, and each bundle representing himself and his brothers, and those bundles that represented his brothers bowed down to him. And you remember him sharing that, and his brothers really did not care for him sharing that dream with them. You later see, as Joseph has been sold into slavery by his brothers because they hated him, and Joseph ends up being falsely accused and put into prison, we see that Joseph comes out of prison at the call of Pharaoh, who was head over all of Egypt, because Pharaoh had a dream. And in the two dreams that Pharaoh had, one of those was the imagery of these two fat cows, or these fat cows and these um, skinny cows, uh, seven. And then these seven bundles of plump grain and seven bundles of skinny grain. And, and so we see that imagery of the grain. Where we are in our story right now is because of that dream that Pharaoh had as Joseph gives the interpretation of that dream, that there would be seven years of plenty and there would be seven years of famine. And where we are in the story is that we have had those seven years of plenty that have now passed. Joseph being wise and discerning, last week we looked at that aspect in his life that he was given this place of second in command behind Pharaoh and he was given charge over these seven years of plenty in order to make wise decisions about how to deal with those seven years of plenty in order to sustain the people through those upcoming seven years of famine. And so where we are in the story is that we are probably somewhere within anywhere from six months to maybe even up to two years after this famine has begun. That's where we'll pick up at in the story. The famine has not only been in Egypt, but it has been in the surrounding areas. Jacob, Joseph's dad, and Joseph's brothers are facing famine in the land of Canaan. And so this famine has not only affected those in Egypt, but this famine is also affecting those in the neighboring areas. And so we have been focusing on God's faithfulness in troubling times. You're going to face troubled times in your life. You may be in the midst of a troubling time right now. You may have just recently come out of a troubling time and you're just giving thanks to God that you made it through. But we are, we're going to face troubling times and we need to hold on to the truth that God is faithful. God is faithful in the times of good and he's faithful in the times of struggle. And Joseph as he goes through all of these hard times in his life as he comes to a point in which he could have been very vengeful towards his brothers, we hear him in Genesis 50 verse 20 say, what you intended for evil, speaking to his brothers who had sold him into slavery, what you've intended for evil, God has intended it for the good. And that good was for the saving of many souls. And so that's where we're journeying into, that's where we're coming into in the story of seeing how God indeed is doing a good and a great work. Last week we focused on a man like this. We focused on Joseph, a man like this. He was a man in which the Spirit of God was very evident. 
He was a man who was willing to lead. He was a man who was fruitful. He was a man who was wise and discerning. And so uh, that was, was kind of our focus on uh, Joseph, that you and I would be a man like this. But this morning we're going to focus on men like this. We're going to focus on his brothers. And I'm not going to encourage you to be men like this. I want you to be a man like this with Joseph, but not of his brothers. And so this morning, we're going to be in Genesis 42. Uh, we're going to look at two verses in Genesis 42, but I want to kind of set the stage for you as to what chapter 42 is all about. Chapter 42 begins with Jacob. It begins in the land of Canaan with Joseph's dad, Jacob, and his brothers. Basically, what happens is as the food supply becomes short because of the famine, Jacob looks to his sons and he says to them, why are you just sitting here? Why are you just sitting here? We know that down in the land of Egypt, there is food. Go buy some food in Egypt lest we die. And so Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to buy food. Now, he does not send Benjamin. Remember, Benjamin and Joseph are brothers by the same mother, the mother that Jacob loved, Rachel. He does not send Benjamin because Jacob is already heartbroken over the loss of Joseph, and he says, I'm not going to send Benjamin unless harm comes to him. And so the ten brothers, you know, the ten brothers who betrayed Joseph, those ten brothers, they head down to Egypt in order to buy grain. And so when they get to Egypt, the picture that we receive is that, that it was not just the brothers, but there was other people coming not only from Egypt, but from Canaan and other parts of the world were coming to Egypt to buy grain. So there's, there's a whole host of people who are coming to buy grain. As Joseph's brothers come to Joseph to buy grain, they bow down before him, giving him honor as the one who would be selling the grain, as the one who was in charge. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but his brothers do not recognize Joseph. And Joseph, through an interpreter, he speaks a little harshly to them, asking them where they have come from. And Joseph remembers the dream that God had given him. And so Joseph's brothers say, we've come from the land of Canaan to buy grain, to buy food for ourselves. And Joseph says, you're spies. You've come to spy out the nakedness of Egypt. The brothers say, no, 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 we're honest men. We're honest men. We are 12 brothers of the same father. Our youngest brother is in Canaan with our father, and one is no more. And Joseph says, you're spies, and to validate the truth that you're not a spy, I'll send one of you back to Canaan to get your younger brother and bring him back here. And so he puts all ten of them in jail for three days. They had a little opportunity to talk to one another, I'm guessing, during that time. As Joseph approaches them on that third day, Joseph says, I'm going to keep one of you in prison. And I'm going to send the nine of you back to get your brother. And send food with you because of the severity of the famine. That your family will have food to eat. What happens at this point, 
as the brothers do not know that this is Joseph, and as Joseph has been using an interpreter to speak to them, Joseph hears the conversation that his brothers have with one another. And we will examine that conversation in just a moment. As Joseph hears that conversation and he knows what they are saying, Joseph turns away and begins to weep. And then Joseph comes back to his brothers and he binds up Simeon and puts Simeon in the prison and he releases the other nine brothers and he gives instruction that they are to take bags of grain back with them and the money sacks that they had to buy the grain with those money sacks were to be put back into the sack with the grain. And so the servants did exactly what Joseph told them to do. And so Joseph's nine brothers begin their journey back to Canaan. In that first night's stay, as they found a place to lodge, one of the brothers opens up his sack of grain in order to give the donkeys a little something or other to eat. And he sees that bag of money that should have been used to buy the grain. And the cry of the brothers is this, what has God done to us? They were afraid. So they continue their journey home and as they get to their father Jacob, they tell their father Jacob all that has happened telling of being accused of being spies and, and telling the family information for which he now wants Benjamin to come in order to see that they were telling the truth and that Simeon could be taken out of jail. And they begin to open their sacks of grain, each one finding their money sack in the bags of grain and they become very fearful and Jacob says Benjamin cannot go Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more I can't let this happen to Benjamin Reuben you remember Reuben Reuben steps forward to his dad and says, Dad, I will protect Benjamin. If any harm comes on Benjamin, you can kill my two sons. That's where the story comes to an end for chapter 42. Here's a truth I want you to hold on to. God is faithful to do what He says He will do. God is faithful to do what He says He will do. You think about Joseph's dream. God was faithful 20 plus years later to do what He said He would do. Seven plus years prior what God said He would do of seven years of abundance and seven years of famine, God will do what God says He will do. This is good. It's a great thing when we are walking in agreement with what God has said. But it is a fearful thing when we are walking in opposition to what God says, and there will be no peace in our lives when we are walking against what God has said, and that is clearly the struggle of peace that his brothers are facing right now. Look with me at verses 21 and 22. This is the conversation that Joseph heard his brothers have as he then turns and weeps. 
Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that your word brings into our lives. We thank you for the correction that your word brings into our lives. We thank you for the goodness of your word as it works effectively in our lives. And so, God, for those who have yet to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that this morning you would open their eyes to their need to turn to you as Lord and Savior. God, for those who already know you as Lord and Savior, God, I pray that through your word you would challenge our hearts. And Lord, in areas in which there needs correct, correcting, God, I pray that we would be open to that correcting from you. We would allow that correcting from you. God, in those areas in which, God, we need encouragement and strength, we pray that you would just lift us up in this time and give us that encouragement and that strength that we need. And so, God, in these next few moments, I pray that we would be open to hearing from you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There'll be two points this morning. The first point is this. It's the problem. The problem is guilt from past sins. This is what we're seeing in the life of these brothers. They are dealing with guilt from their past sins. Now, the struggle of this guilt that has come upon them right now, the struggle of this guilt is they are in a troubled time. They are in a time of distress themselves. They are facing a hard time. And so this guilt is resurfacing itself in the midst of the distress that they are in. When we look at verse 21, what we see in verse 21 is the first thing that comes out of their mouths here at this moment in verse 21 is, we are guilty concerning our brother. Now I want you to think about it for just a moment. Could it be that for quite some time there has been much justification given on their part for why they did what they did? You know, he was, he was arrogant. You know, he, he, he talked this way and he shouldn't have talked this way about us. You know, he, he told our dad about the things that we were doing wrong. He should have not have been a tattletaler. So he got what was coming to him. You know, sometimes we justify our sins. Sometimes we make excuses for our sins. At this point, in the distress that they're facing, they are saying, we are guilty of what we've done against our brother. They are facing the guilt, they're facing the shame in this moment of distress, in this moment of trial in their lives. They're at that place in which they are feeling guilty. As you go on and read in verse 21, it says, We saw the distress of his soul. Do you remember a number of weeks ago when we were reading Genesis 37 and I sat down on the edge of this pulpit for that moment in Genesis 37 where Joseph's brothers seize a hold of Joseph and they throw him in the pit. In verse 21, it says, We saw the distress of his soul, we heard the cry for help, and we did not listen. Do you remember in Genesis 37, I think it is a very pivotal moment, it is a very powerful moment as we come to this point right here. Genesis 37 tells us that when they seized Joseph and they ripped that coat off of him, they throwed him down into a pit that had no water, and they sat on the edge of that pit. And they had lunch. We saw the distress of Joseph. As they're having lunch, they see the distress of their brother that they have thrown into the pit. As they're eating that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, they're hearing him crying out, for help, but they did not listen. They did not listen. 
And so now at a point of distress themselves, now at a point in which they are crying out for help, they are recognizing once again the guilt of what they have done. They go on in verse 27 to say, that is why this distress has come upon us. In other words, they are saying, We are now reaping what we have sown. We are now facing the consequences of what we did 20 plus years ago. And in verse 22, Reuben, and you've just got to picture this for just a moment, Reuben, do you remember that Reuben in Genesis 37, before Joseph ever got there, said to his brothers, Let's do no harm to our brother. Let's put him down in this pit because Reuben intended to come back later and rescue him out of the pit and take him back to his father Jacob. Reuben says in the presence of Joseph, who likely had no idea of this, Reuben said, did I not tell you not to hurt the boy, and you did not listen. And Joseph turns, and he weeps. He weeps. The brothers are struggling with the guilt. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They are dealing with guilt in this hard time, in this time of distress, but I want to call your attention to something, that this struggle with guilt, here's the reality, it has persisted for 20 plus years. This is not just a one-time event in which they have felt guilty. Joseph, 17 years of age, when his brothers do this evil act against him. Genesis 41 tells us that when Joseph entered into Pharaoh's service, at the beginning of those seven years of plenty, Joseph was 30 years old. There has now been the seven years of plenty. Joseph is now 37 years old. It has been 20 plus years And in this time of distress, in this time of trial in their lives, they are called back to that guilt of what they did 20 years ago. What about you, church? Are there sins from many years ago that you continue to feel guilty about? Are there sins from many years ago that you continue to feel guilty about? Does it seem like when things are going well, you really aren't thinking about those things, but when there's a crisis that hits, all of a sudden I'm feeling guilty about what I did many years ago. That's where the brothers are right now. The brothers are in that place, and Joseph has heard his brothers as they have expressed these things. And I can't help but to think, maybe for Joseph, maybe for Joseph, Joseph recognizes that life has been hard for him. Life has been hard. It has not been easy for Joseph. For 13 years there, it was difficult. It was was hard on Joseph. But maybe for Joseph, as he hears this guilt of his brothers, Joseph recognizes that he would rather have a hard life with a clear conscience and peace with God than to have been been a free man carrying the guilt and shame of his sin around. Maybe Joseph was even somewhat grieved for what his brothers had been through internally. 
So what's the solution? The solution for his brothers is the same solution for you and for me if we're dealing with guilt over sin issues. It's repentance. It's repentance. For his brothers and for you and for me, the solution to the problem of guilt is repentance. It begins with confession. Confession to God. First and foremost, confession to God. And that confession to God of our sin with the desire of our heart and our mind to turn away from that sin. But you know, that confession often needs to be brought to the very person that we've offended. And sometimes when our offense is against another person and God is putting that burden on our hearts, we must obey God even as difficult as it is. With repentance, sometimes there's consequences to that confession. I want you to think about Joseph's brothers for just a moment. They go home to their dad and they take that coat of many colors and, and they said, Dad, look, all the evidence is Joseph has been consumed by a wild beast. That was the lie. They knew that Joseph had been sold into slavery. And their dad weeps. Their dad mourns. And there was a period of mourning. And even today, there's evidence in this passage that Jacob's heart was still breaking for the loss of Joseph. And his boys, some point in these 20 years, could have said, Dad, we lied to you. Dad, we sinned against you and we sinned against God. We sold Joseph into slavery. We had such hatred towards him that we did such an evil act. Joseph may not be dead because he was alive when we sold him into slavery. You know, that would have been difficult on their relationship with their dad. You know, a lot of times as we make those confessions, there are still consequences that we may face in regards to the sin that we have committed. But as we confess that, and as we repent of our sins, God can bring a peace upon us that Joseph's brothers did not know. There can be a freeing from that guilt and from that shame that only God can bring with confession. And the harsh truth is that, bro that Joseph's brothers were reluctant to face the consequences of telling their dad that Joseph had not been killed. There's still no evidence in this story of true repentance on their part. I want to take us at this point to something that I think is very important to close this on. Joseph's brothers were feeling guilt from sins that they had committed. And God will often convict our hearts of sin so that we will confess that sin, be forgiven of that sin, and find healing in our relationship with God and our relationship with man. But I want to warn you of condemnation. Condemnation. When God has convicted your heart of sin, and you have repented of that sin. You have confessed that sin. You have turned away from that sin. Understand this. You have an enemy who is going to seek to condemn you over that sin. Revelation 12.10. John speaks of Satan as being the accuser of brothers, the accuser 
of brothers. And so here's what I want to challenge you with. Every one of us has sin issues in our past. And for some of us, maybe we're in a place in which we have confessed those sins and we have repented of those sins, but it seems like it just comes up over and over again, and that is condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if there are sin issues in your past and you're struggling with guilt over those sin issues, but you know that you've confessed those things to God, you've asked God for the forgiveness of those sins, you have repented from those things, understand that is not God convicting you of sin, but that is Satan who is condemning you. And you stand toe-to-toe with Satan and you say to him, this is the truth. I know that I did those things in the past. I know that I hurt those people greatly. I know that I hurt God greatly, but I have confessed my sins. I have repented of my sins. And God's Word says that if I confess my sins, He is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I will not listen to your condemnation anymore. I'll not listen to your condemnation anymore. If God is convicting your heart of a sin issue, you confess it and you repent of it. But if Satan is condemning you, you stand firm on the truth of God's Word. So here's my challenge for us in closing. Pursue peace in your heart. Pursue peace in your heart by confessing and repenting of sin. And then you reject all the condemnation that will follow by the accuser of the brothers. You know, the aspect of confession and repentance, it really does begin at salvation. It begins at salvation. For some of you, maybe you've not come to that place in your life that you're willing to acknowledge to God. I am a sinner. You know, there's no way that you can tell God all the sins that you've committed. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought just how many sins we commit and there's absolutely no way that we could confess to Him every single sin that we have sinned? But when by faith we come to this holy God and we say, oh God, I am a sinner who does not deserve your grace. But I believe that Jesus died for me. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. He will will forgive you of your sins. He will come into your life and give you a new life for all of eternity. And so if you've not made that decision, that really is the first decision to make today. You can go through this entire lifetime and never have peace with God. And if you don't come to peace with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, then you'll spend all of eternity separated from God. But if by faith you'll receive Him, You'll find peace with God today. And you'll walk with Him for all of eternity in the glories of heaven. And so if that's the decision you need to make, I want to encourage you to make that decision today. And for those of you who are Christians, if God is speaking to your heart about an unconfessed sin, about a sin issue, maybe... Maybe that confession needs to be not only to God, but maybe it needs to also be to that person you've offended. Maybe that confession needs to be not only to God, but maybe that confession needs to be to somebody else who will help hold you accountable to walk in repentance, to bear the fruit of repentance. James says, confess your sins to one another that you may find healing. And so maybe for some of you this morning, there is 
that need that needs to happen. But maybe for some of you who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have confessed a sin issue that continues to resurface itself in your life, maybe this morning you need to stand firm on the truth of God's Word and reject the condemnation that the enemy is bringing. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look at these men, these men who were struggling with guilt and shame over sins that long should have been repented of. And so, God, I pray for those this morning who are following you as Lord and Savior, but there are some sin issues, there is a sin issue that, God, you're convicting their hearts of, that they need to confess, that they need to repent of. God, I pray that this morning they would be obedient to you. I pray that they would be willing to confess their sins to you and that, God, you would cleanse them and that, God, they could walk in peace with you. God, I pray for those who have confessed their sins to you and they know that that this sin was a grievous sin. They know their heart has been broken over the sin. And God, they've confessed it to you. They've cried it out to you. But God, they continue to feel this condemnation. God, I pray that they may be able to stand upon your word, to stand upon the truth and to believe that God, you have forgiven them. And they would be willing to stand before that accuser and say to that accuser, that's a lie. I will not believe that lie for I am forgiven. I am cleansed because of the blood of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for those who have yet to trust you, who have yet to surrender to you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you would help them understand their need of confession. And as your word says, that we would repent, that we would turn from our wickedness, that we would turn from the crookedness of this generation, that we would turn away from idols. And so, God, I pray for those who need to trust you as Lord and Savior. I pray that they would come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. They would receive you. They would pray, receiving you as Lord and Savior. I pray that they'd be willing to tell a friend who could help them to grow. I pray that they'd be willing to come and tell me that we as a church can help them to grow in their faith in you. And so, God, in these next couple of moments here, God, would you seal in our hearts what we need to do? And more importantly, God, I pray That if you're calling us to obey you in any kind of way, that God, we would be quick to obey. To be doers of your word and not just hearers only. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for making that choice uh, to be here. Continue to pray for the ongoing opportunities of the church. Um, In between services, Ms. LaFon Daniels Sunday School class is meeting. Uh, The home group meets uh, on...